my point would be we have a natural process of those inhibitions being wielded in an ever more sophisticated way that does ever better sideline things like violence. Society is getting less violent. If you look over a long time scale, it's getting less violent in terms of your risk walking down the street, more tolerant, etc. But that the problem is that that has functioned as a means to an end, and the end is a genetic one, even though we're not aware of it. If you look at society, any society, it may look increasingly peaceful, but in part, it's being increasingly peaceful on the inside is strengthening it for battle with other societies on the outside. And ultimately, we can't play that game forever, right? There is no, there are no new continents. Our weapons are too powerful. Um, we are too interconnected. We are all bound together in one experiment. And if we continue to allow a dynamic that brought us here to rule, to govern our behavior, we will extinguish ourselves in short order. So my point is the, the genes and competition between lineages was good enough to generate all the amazing stuff that's built into humans. It also generated all the horrifying stuff. It is now time for us to choose between them because in some sense, we've run to the end of the tape. We have now gotten to a place where the game that brought us here will be fatal we can say that with essential, essentially certainty um, at this point because of the power of our tools, right? 500 years ago, a human population that uh, was foolish could extinguish itself, but it couldn't extinguish humanity. And now we are at the point where a foolish population can take humanity out, and it's only a Maybe matter a of time. Maybe a foolish individual. Yeah, even a foolish individual. Well, I, increasingly we're moving to, well, I certainly, I certainly don't disagree with that. Um, that that danger, I guess I, 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 you know, I've I've always been attracted to the union idea of integration of the shadow, and that is not an inhibition argument. It's a it's an integration argument, and so I would say, rather than, and I think this is an important difference is that there's lots of ways that you can be a warrior, that are in keeping with reciprocity, but allow that fundamental motivational force to still have its say. Now, let, 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 one of the th things that I think capitalism is, I think capitalism is underappreciated for its vices. So it's better that warlike men establish mercantile empires than uh, empires of war. And so, and I think rather than the whole sh scale remodeling of our group, uh, of our proclivity for group aggression, we need to figure out how to refine and, and orient it. Um, so capitalism is a landscape of competition. It's not only that, because it's also a landscape of cooperation. And virtually everything we do is a landscape of competition and cooperation. But I see, for example, misguided efforts to insist that all games among children be cooperative as a way of dampening down the competitive impulse. And to me, that, that is, that's going to make things worse rather than better. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you're, what you're aiming at, but it, is it, look, we, we, we share a common view of this problem. The problem is, is that we've become so technologically powerful that our moral failings are increasingly fatal. Okay, so what do we do about that? Well, my, my answer to that, to the degree that I have one, is that, well, we learn to play the best of all possible games. And we bring all of that evolutionary heritage on board to play that game. And that's a, that's a sublimation and a sophistication. And, and it, it's sort of, Piaget rather than Freud in some sense. Yeah, I would say, uh, w w I think we're in near perfect agreement here. We have to learn each other's language about it. Yes. But what I would say is, you know, uh, an explosion is a very dangerous thing, but it's a marvelous thing in a cylinder where it can be used to do physical work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the point is, yeah, 
Let's not pretend that we are something other than we are, but let's take those impulses and channel them to something productive. And so yes. this, this is actually- Well, that's good because I can bring that back to my book now because that's <laughs> what I'm, that is really what I'm trying to do in these three books is to say, well, look, don't underestimate your downside, your capacity for mayhem, but- don't assume that that makes you unredeemable. Don't be so afraid of it that you can't admit to it. That'll make it even worse. And find something better to do. We're jealous and resentful and, re and vengeful and bitter and all of those things. And I also, especially in chapter 11 of the new book, try to explain why we have those motivations and why they're so powerful, again, to give the devil his due. But to say, nonetheless, well, we have to get beyond that, despite the fact that despite the reasons for our motives, for our dark motives. Well, so, and I, the thing is, we know that we are capable of marvelous things. And frankly, I don't think this puzzle is as hard as it seems if we set ourselves to it. If we're continually battling over whether or not it's real, then I, I don't think we're going to make it. But okay, so let me let me offer you a practical problem. I've been talking to uh, Bjorn Lomborg and Matt Ridley on my podcasts, and they're future optimists. In in within a materialistic framework, fundamentally, both of them insist that things are not as dire as they're painted. But regardless of that, what they do point to, like. Um, um, Steven Pinker, I would say, is that we've made tremendous progress on all sorts of dimensions in the last three or 400 years. And there's every reason to assume that we could continue doing that over the next hundred years if we got our priorities straight. It's within our capability. And so you can look at such things. And I think these are hard bits of data, although time frame is always a problem. Um, we're, there are far fewer people in abject poverty by proportion now than there were 40 years ago. And 40 years ago, there were much fewer, mu much fewer than there was 100 years ago. And that trajectory appears to be continuing. We can continue to make incremental improvements in the material well-being of everyone by and there's limits, obviously, and the economists and the biologists argue about what those limits might be. But one of the problems with that view is that it's not saleable. You know, it doesn't have, for some reason, it doesn't have the kind of motive power that enables people to get on board and get enthusiastic about it. Well, and I also I, don't think, I don't think it's, I must say, I have mixed reactions. I'm a, I'm a fan of Ridley's, uh, not so much Lomborg's. Um, and I have mixed feelings about Pinker's view. There's obviously some truth in it, but I believe it goes out of its way to miss the counter argument. And well, it might, it, it might go out of its way to miss the, you know, even from, from a rhetorical perspective. And, you know, I would look at that symbolically. I would say, look, there's a, there's a tyrant and there's a wise king, and they're both there. And if you only look at the tyrant, that's the corruption of society, then you're missing half the story. And I would imagine that Pinker would say, well, people are looking at the tyrant so hard that we need to look at the wise king a little bit more. Well, I, I would take a different approach to this. So I would argue that things have gotten better. The, the Pinker pattern is recognizable, but that it is it cannot be indefinitely extended. And that the limit is that we've come to a place where lineage versus lineage competition on a planet of this size with a population as large as we have and the technologies that we've got is a fatal proposition, almost no matter how it plays out. So in order to take the pattern that has continued to this point and extend it indefinitely into the future, you have to do two things. One of them we've already described, which is you have to take the genes out of the driver's seat, which is frankly in the long-term interest of the genes, but genes are too dim to see it, right? So we have to take uh, effectively a 
something like a Buddhist approach to uh, long-term well-being. We have to become very uh, dedicated to the idea of sustainability, and I realize how hard it is to operationalize an idea like that, but somehow we cannot keep degrading the planet and uh, imagining that we're going to technologically rescue it. Well, we're I already... hope your conscience does that, technically well, speaking. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm dead serious about this, because you, you just said something of crucial importance, and I think it's at the core. There's an argument that's always going on now between biologists and economists, I would say, that they're the two camps. And the economists say human ingenuity can continually rescue us from whatever problems are likely to emerge. And the biologists say, well, never forget Malthus. And it's a matter of time frame, which is the argument you made. It's like, well, that's working now. You know, there's that famous bet between um, Paul Ehrlich and Simon. And Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb, yep. a very pessimistic book. And he believed at that point, 68, I think, that there would be mass starvation and a terrible shortage of material resources by the year 2000. And he had a famous bet with Simon, who was a genius in his own right, certainly the intellectual match for Ehrlich. And Simon said, no, I'll bet you that everything will be cheaper and people will be less hungry. And Simon won the bet. Of now, course. Ehrlich could say, yeah, yeah, well, I got it wrong by 50 years, or I got it wrong by 100 time frames, deadly, deadly. Yep. So, but, but okay, we can take time frames serious. Seriously, I've been taking this idea of an intrinsic, evolutionarily determined, biologically based ethic seriously. And I think that the voice of conscience is the voice of sustainability and iterability speaking within and it's not overwhelming it's not overwhelming because you have to sacrifice the future for the present fairly often it turns out that way right because you have to you have to you have to make snap emergency decisions that might not be in your best long-term interest but the long-term interest speaks inside you agreed and, agreed and so but okay. less, le okay. less and less well as we have abandoned the mythology that used to undergird it. So as we well, have become a, okay, more so why secular. Would you say that? Why would you say that's a very interesting thing to say? Why do you believe that? Well, I, I, first of all, the problem with cultural evolution is that if we talk about genetic adaptations, you can look at virtually any creature, virtually any appendage, virtually any behavior in uh, a non-human creature in its natural environment and be pretty sure it makes a good deal of sense, right? The stuff that didn't make sense got pruned away. It's not there to see. How it makes sense, that's a tough question, but whether it makes sense, not tough, almost ever. In human cultural evolution space, that is not the case, right? We have a huge amount of noise, stuff that will not stand the test of time, that nonetheless dominates our current cultural landscape. And so we can't go into it and assume these things make sense. So what I'm telling you is that, in my view, the religious mythology was doing jobs that we don't know. Some of them we can mm -hmm. piece together. Some of them we'll never understand what the role of a particular mythological belief was. But what we have now is kind of an intermediate level of sophistication, where we've gotten past some of the religious mythology, but without the wisdom necessary to replace it with anything that does the jobs that it was doing. And so we're now screwing up left and right, you know. Hmm. That's the right way to put it, too, because most of this, see, what to me, what's happened is that functional mythology has been replaced by inadequate ideology. And the ideology, and I wrote about this in Beyond Order, there's a chapter called abandoned ideology. I think of ideologies as parasites on a, fun, on, a, on, a, on a religious platform. They have their power. The power they have is because they derive their power from an underlying mythological narrative structure, but they, they only tell half the story. If that, that's, that's akin to, that, that's an idea that's akin to the one that you just laid out. Yeah, I think so. Although I think you're being generous to call it all ideology. I'd say some of it's just idiocy. Right, we've we've replaced a structure that worked that is now n not viable because it's not in the environment for which it adapted, but we've replaced it with something that doesn't stand any chance of working, and we keep, uh, you know, 
one self-inflicted wound after the next. And either we're going to figure out that pattern and recognize that the function that we're using to generate the next level of uh, behavior and culture is a, a lethal hazard, or it's going to take us out. So I, I would say the key, if I can go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, the key to continuing the trajectory of improvement that has been recognized by uh, Pinker and Ridley, at least, is to understand that it needs to be based on something else going forward, that the limits of the system that they are recognizing, ha we have to go through a, uh, a revolution in the way we um, sustain ourselves. We cannot fuel it on lineage versus lineage competition. However, what we mustn't do is either create a stagnation that causes the human beings to react in the way that they do when uh, they run up to, against the limits of a landscape, a physical landscape, or run up against the limits of uh, economic growth, both of which would be a disaster. So we have to create a steady state in which we don't degrade the planet, but we do give the human beings the sensation of living in a time of growth. That's going to be the key, right? Human beings, when they are well, involved... I, I want to I want to decorate that slightly. I mean, sure. part of the problem here too is that, I, when you're absolutely deprived, having that deprivation remediated is powerfully motivating. But as the deprivation decreases, the motivating power of the remediation decreases. And so I would also say that arguing for the uh, motivational viability of a more generous material landscape is also a, a game that is decreasing in its attractiveness. Because, right. you know, one, one of the things I realized a few years ago was that um, if you're stuck in traffic, it makes very little difference how expensive your car is. That there's, we've we've hit, we've hit the point where we most people, many people, have enough, so that having more isn't going to be of that much utility. And I'm not talking about people who are still absolutely deprived. And I understand full well that a large percentage of the population, decreasing though it may be, are still in a state of absolute deprivation. I'm not, and, they, and they're going to be motivated by the desire for material improvement, for sure. But those of us who are, in, who, who are past that, and I would say that's virtually everyone in North America that isn't suffering for reasons that material cannot remediate, we're wealthy, we have heat, we have refrigeration, we have an, an infinite expanse of informational technology that can all be improved, but the improvements aren't going to make that much difference. What, what's next? Like, what do you do when you have enough? All right. So and you try to make everyone else have enough. That's something, right? That's something and it's worth it. But even that is a, that's happening. 